interreligious dialogue is an important step towards peace in the Middle East. Peace in the Middle East will come when the peoples of the Middle East want peace. The American Religious Town Hall meeting is now in session. Welcome, friends, to the American Religious Town Hall meeting, where the discussion of religious, political, and social issues is meant to promote the cause of religious freedom and to help us better understand each other. And now, here's your host and moderator, Pastor Jerry Lutz. Thank you for joining us today. I, too, would like to welcome you to today's program. It's a very important discussion. It's one that we've had before around this table, but there have been some new developments recently that we're going to focus on for today. Before we get started, I'd like for you to meet the panelists. Let's begin with the gentleman to my right. I'm going to ask that everyone around the table say who they are and a little bit about what they do. So please. My name is Canon John Peterson. I am an Episcopal priest, canonically resident of the Diocese of Washington. And I've also been the coordinator for the series of Christian Muslim summits uh, sponsored and supported by the National Cathedral in Washington. My name is Mel Robeck. I'm senior professor of church history and ecumenics, as well as special assistant to the president for ecumenical relations at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I'm also an Assemblies of God minister. I'm Tom Plumley. I'm a minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I serve as senior minister of First Christian Church, Fort Worth, Texas. I'm Andrea Luxton. I'm president of Andrews University, which is in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and we are affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hi, I'm Carl Troval. I'm the Richard J. Dinda Professor of uh, Lutheran Identity and Mission at Concordia University in Austin, Texas. I'm Rabbi Dan Levin. I'm the Senior Rabbi at Temple Bethel in Boca Raton, Florida. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. As you can see, we have very well qualified panelists today for this discussion. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too, so let's get started. Recently, the Abrahamic Faiths Initiative Group united 25 religious leaders representing millions of Christians, Muslims, and Jewish faithful to discuss practical ways of promoting peace and fraternity at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Many peacemaking efforts have failed because they don't consider the religious implications of their initiatives, according to Sam Brownbeck, the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Religious Freedom, who also attended. He said this, I think the world is crying for this movement. And then adding that even though the world might not want to talk about religion, the matter cannot be ignored. We still don't have peace in the Middle East and the prospects don't look particularly good. Close quote. In its final statement, the Abrahamic Faiths Initiative members vowed, quote, to seek to serve those of other faiths and no faith close quote, and condemned those who use the name of God or the teachings of Abraham to incite bloodshed or to oppress others. Participants at the event met with Pope Francis, and in their final statement, they quoted his document on human fraternity for world peace and living together, signed in February last year with the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmed el Tayeb in the United Arab Emirates. But as one participant commented, quote, a focus on practical action rather than dogma is key to bringing about lasting results, close quote. That was according to Rabbi David Rosen, International Director of Interreligious Affairs of the American Jewish Committee. Rosen continued, far from being a contributing factor for conflict and violence, religions are essential to create an enduring and meaningful peace adding that the Rome gathering could potentially be historic by bringing together the religious, political, and diplomatic realms, which so far have seen, quote, some mutual alienation, close quote. Well, this is our subject for today, and I would like our panelists to consider these three questions to answer. Do you think the AFI group is on the right track with their attempt to build peace in the Middle East on a foundation of fraternity? 
Another question, how can people of other religions and atheists not represented at this gathering be brought into this effort to affect peace in the Middle East? And then finally, do you agree with Rabbi Rosen's assertion that a focus on practical action rather than dogma is key to bringing about lasting results? Well, that is our subject, and those are our questions I've asked our panelists to consider. Let's go back to one of the gentlemen who helped to begin the program, then we'll go to the other. But first, John Peterson, glad to have you here. And further comments on this fascinating subject. Well, thank you so much. And I do think this is a fascinating subject and one that uh, has certainly been a passion of mine for a couple decades. Uh, I want to commend at the very outset the Abrahamic Faith Initiative uh, for what they have done to bring people together of Muslim, Christians, and Jews uh, to have the discussion uh, for a couple of days in relationship to this subject. Uh, they deserve a lot of credit, and particularly those uh, leaders uh, from the Muslim and Jewish and Christian traditions who were attended. Uh, this, the uh, Abrahamic Faith Initiative is one of many initiatives that has taken place in the last several years in relationship to uh, trying to find this dialogue, trying to reach out for a form of peace in the Middle East. Uh, one can only think of the common word, which was uh, a very significant um, uh, dialogue th that uh, happened oh, five, six years ago now, and certainly one that uh, one must look at seriously in this type of uh, discussion. And the other is the Christian Muslim Summit, which I mentioned in the introduction, that was coordinated uh, actually at the request of President um, Mohammed um, Hatami, the former president of Iran, asked the National Cathedral to be involved in putting this type of discussion together. So Shia, Shias, uh, Sunnis, Shias, uh, Catholics and um, Anglicans would be in this uh, type of a dialogue. And so this is really important work that is going on. Uh, but I also have to say that I am in full agreement with um, uh, the rabbi in relationship to his counter to this, because it's ultimately the people of the land who are going to be ultimately having to find the peace. Now, that being said, I'm, I'm a firm believer in these global international meetings. But attending uh, the Abrahamic um, Faith Initiative group was um, uh, Imam Muhammad Majid from the Old Dulles um, Mosque in uh, Washington area. And he pointed something out that I think is critically important, which has not been taken into very serious consideration. And that is that he called for this to also be brought down to the grassroots. And one of the problems with these types of dialogues is that it stays on a level of leadership within the communities, but never gets down to the grassroots in, the, in our synagogues, in our mosques, in our churches. And that it, until that happens, these ultimately discussions will never come to fruition because it's ultimately the grassroots that is so critically important here. All right, thank you very much. And Rabbi Levin, yes, you did also start the program with a counter statement. Uh, a few more thoughts on that subject from your perspective, please. So first, it's an honor to be here with this panel. Uh, whenever I take groups to Israel or to learn about the Middle East, uh, the one thing that I always want to make sure that everyone comes away with is that the answer to almost all these questions is it's complicated. <laughs> and I think that the number of variables that create the level of conflict that we see in the Middle East is uh, an, a Gordian knot that is uh, almost impossible to completely fathom. Uh, that said, the Abrahamic Faiths Initiative has done something extraordinarily important by doing a few things that I think really matter. The first thing they've done is they have created a platform really for the first time that legitimates other religious faiths, that it says to a Muslim, Christianity and Judaism are valid. It says to a Christian that Islam and Judaism are valid. It says to a Jew that these other faiths that have spun off of the trunk of the Jewish tree are valid expressions of the divine. And just that statement alone that says, I have to respect the humanity 
of someone who professes a different belief system than I is to me far more uh, crucial than I think maybe we appreciate. Uh, that humanization of the other is I think one of the real missing links to peace in the Middle East where people get so locked into their religious culture, their religious framework, and they believe my way is the one way that God wants and no other way will suffice. And that kind of religious ideology, I think, is at the root of what not only takes people away from religion, but is the source of a lot of conflict in that part of the world. The things that are also part of that conflict in the world are the systemization of repression and oppression and poverty and uh, the inaccessibility of human rights to so many people who live in that part of the world that contributes to the conflicts that we see that pervade that world. But that sense that we have beginning to sense a, a creation and appreciation and knowledge of the other I think we'll begin to invite people at the grassroots, as you say, it signals to the grassroots to say, oh, I can think differently. And once you start teaching people and give them permission to think differently, you open up doorways to paths to peace. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Trovall, welcome to the program. Thank you. Your thoughts on the subject, please. Well, I'm gonna admit that I, uh, this is an area in which I uh, have very little experience. I, 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 and so it's hard for me to articulate uh, anything specific other than in, in a broad brush. I mean, I appreciate what both John and Dan have brought to the table and how important this is because I think anytime people are talking to one another and trying to find commonalities, respecting each other's humanity, that we're, that's always a move forward. Uh, I, I'm gonna share an experience of mine that's gonna be more personal, but I think it does connect in this way in that I've taught a world religions class. And I always find that in these classes when other students understand other religious systems and other religious beliefs as being surprisingly connected to their own that have similar expressions even though they're different belief systems. Uh, they, f they become empowered by the recognition of the other faith. And I would hope that something like this would hopefully move toward the grassroots where people can see uh, uh, the power of the other belief system, even enriching and nourishing their own. All right, thank you very much. And Dr. Luxton, glad to have you here today as well. Your perspective, please. No, thinking about this, I thought about how change happens, and it seems to me that change happens when you have the right people uh, with the right process at the right time. And if you have one of those issues out of the picture, it's not going to work although it might be a step forward. And it seems that, that this is a wonderful way of bringing the right groups around the table with even partly a right, a, a, an approach that allows listening and conversation rather than diatribe. So there's a, there's a lot that seems right about it. Um, but it does seem as though this may be a group to start with, but unless this as we've already heard, moves down to the people that are actually on the ground. We may not have all the right people at the table, but we may have the right representatives at the table, but maybe not necessarily the right people. And then the right time, that comes down to the tone and the mood of, of, of what the people on the ground want as well. So I think there are some real complications here, some great ideas um, <coughs> conceptually. Can it bring change? Maybe partially, but I, I don't know that we've really touched, it's really touching where things need to be yet. All right, thank you very much. And Reverend Plumley, uh, your, your perspective, please. <laughs> thank you. This, th this whole area of conversation is, is, is near to the heart of every, every disciple. Um, uh, we, we grew up as a movement on the frontier to unite the church and uh, since have found that, that, yes, uniting the church is, is, is a part of what we're about, but also finding uh, uh, commonality with, with those of other faiths as well. So we've been very involved in, in uh, interfaith movements as well. And I wanna say, I wanna say kudos to, to anyone, <coughs> excuse me, whether they're a part of the Abrahamic Faiths Initiative or whether they're a part of the many groups that, that John Peterson's been a part of, 
or whether they're the ecumenical officer of a of a seminary like 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 Mel is, uh, or, or heck, uh, this program and 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 those of us who who participate on it, uh, uh, we're we're all about seeking ways to build peace and to reduce the the detrimental impact of of the differences among us because because we all have seen that religion far too often in human history has been a source of conflict rather than reconciliation and 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 the clashes of religions uh, have been have been detrimental to to so many people um, and and so any effort uh, to uh, 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 wholeheartedly and, and not, not with any sub, subterfuge uh, uh, find commonality with each other is to be applauded, uh, including this one. All right. Thank you very much. And Dr. Robeck, glad to have you here today. <laughs> it's good to be here. Thank Your thoughts, you. Please. Uh, a lot of thoughts have gone through my mind as I thought through this program. Uh, for one thing, scripture tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I don't know how many of us take that mm. seriously or seriously enough. Uh, but I think it's really important to remember that. The second thing that came through my mind was uh, that, uh, John, you mentioned a common word uh, initiative several years ago. I was part of that whole discussion. Mm -hmm. I signed it, uh, yeah. And uh, I took a lot of flack for that, uh, not just from people from my tradition, but people throughout the Protestant world uh, wrote me some pretty nasty letters and told me that I was compromising and all those kinds of things. But I. I think it's really important to remember that first of all, we were human before we were Christian or Jewish or Muslim. Now, I mean, Jews have a special calling there because they're the people of God according to the Old Testament, but, but the reality is we were human first. And so we have a common bond already in place if we will take advantage of that common bond. I also would say as an ecumenist, because I deal largely with Christian versus Christian kinds of traditions, not interreligious where you would ha ta have Christians and Jews and Muslims. I've done some of that um, and spent a day and a half uh, sponsored by the State Department in the United States talking about Pentecostalism to a group of about 30 Muslim clerics uh, that came from around the world. And I think that's really important as a human being. Uh, but I also think that it's important to recognize that um, that our differences are real and they are substantial and that nothing can be resolved in the Middle East if we don't consider religion as part of the, the mm. package. Because I think there are religious prejudices in all three of our groups uh, that lead us in certain directions. When I think about the Middle East Council of Churches, which would be the appropriate body, I think, that would represent uh, Christians in the Middle East, that's a limited body. I mean, it's, it's limited largely to Catholics, Orthodox, Anglicans, Lutherans, and I believe Presbyterians. But beyond that, it does not go. So I would say for the rest of us, maybe we ought to stay out of it and pray for uh, the peace of Jerusalem uh, through some of these kinds of things. But I, I want to say at the human level, uh, I have found that within the ecumenical world, ecumenism takes place first and foremost in friendships between two individuals. And if you can develop those individual friendships across those religious lines in the Middle East, I think you have a real chance for doing something significant. If you can't develop those friendships, those personal friendships that develop into relationships, that develop trust between those friends, then I don't think anything will ever happen. The last thing I'd like to say is I wonder whether it might be possible to trust the religious organizations and not the diplomats to try to find some kind of uh, mm. response or, or um, work through some kind of a, a project that would enable peace to come to the Middle East. All right, thank you, Dr. Luxton. You wanted to comment first. Well, actually, I was a question I wanted to, to ask for Dan, because in the counter, he said, until the people want it. Mm. And I was wondering if he could perhaps unpack that a little mm. bit, because right, I was intrigued you. by that comment. We have about a minute or less. Uh, in a minute or less. <laughs> Mostly less. Uh, I think we're that against the clock. Uh, part of the scourge of these radical extremist groups that have exposed their religious ideology through violence is that it has made people apart from each other in so many dramatic ways. And they don't see a pathway forward. I think when the peoples of the Middle East are willing to offer to themselves and others opportunities and hope 
and pathways that can lead people away from that radical extremism, then we'll see movement in the Middle East. And I think that so long as people want to remain locked in their own milieu and to say my way is the only way that works and I will fight for it to the death, you're not going to see any movement towards peace in the Middle East. Ultimately, though, I think that when we can find those pathways to opportunity that help people to choose a different path than mm. radical extremism, mm. they end up in a far healthier place and then we'll uh, part to see movement in a better direction. All right, thank you. That's all the time we oh, have man. for this segment, but we are going to come back in just a few moments for the summations. Before that, I'd like for you to hear this important message. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you, Pastor Lutz. We hope you are enjoying today's program. If you would like to learn more about the American Religious Town Hall, please visit our website at AmericanReligious.org. That's AmericanReligious.org. There you can read about the mission and history of the program, learn about the Town Hall Estates, and view past programs by clicking the appropriate menu buttons. Each week, Pastor Lutz looks forward to receiving your letters. You may write to him at the address shown on your screen. Send your letters to Pastor Jerry Lutz, American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas 75218. That's Pastor Jerry Lutz, American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas 75218. Thank you for writing and thank you for watching. And now, back to you, Pastor Lutz, and today's closing statements. Welcome back. I'm so glad you've joined us for today's program. It is an important one. It's one that's been discussed in certain ways in times past, but these are recent developments that we've been considering around the table. I'd like to hear the panelists' summation now, and let's begin with John Peterson. Ken Peterson, you're first. Yes, I would like to ask three questions. How many of our churches are inviting Jews and Muslims to come to try to learn about their core values of peace, love, and respect? How many of our synagogues are inviting Christians and Muslims to come to try to learn about the, their core values of peace, love, and respect? How many of our mosques are inviting Jews and Christians to come to learn about their core values of peace, love, and respect? Mm, interesting, thank you very well. Let's go to Reverend Plumley. your statement please. Thank you. I'll, I'll answer your third question. Uh, the, the, the mosque in Fort Worth, uh, which is the one I'm most familiar with, is the most open of, uh, of all the, the faith communities, uh, I believe, in, in our city uh, to that kind of uh, dialogue. And they are the, they are the ones that, that take the initiative. Um, on my, for, for my own comments, uh, you know, I, I always want to say follow the money. Uh, I think I think that's that's always the, the the key to a search for peace. One of the things that I uh, that I that I wanted to end with, however, was to say that I think a strength of the Abrahamic Faiths Initiative is their effort to encourage members of the various faith groups to confront their own texts to confront their own texts that are often dragged out <coughs> to use in support of violence and war. And that's a key to a way forward for peace. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Choval. Sure, and to piggyback on that, I, I know as a, a young person, I always look to my religious leaders for guidance as to how to interpret the world uh, through eyes of faith. And uh, while I think it, it this is going to be ineffective if it doesn't go to the grassroots. At the bottom, still, what's important is the model that they're setting forth for, for everyone to see that, oh, this is possible. Because first, the leaders have to adopt it, and then it can move through the communities. All right, thank you. Rabbi Levin. I agree with you. I think that if you can model this openness to human understanding and appreciation and respect for those who hold different faith positions, that's incredibly important. I think if we look at what leads people to embrace radical ideologies, it's generally a sense of hopelessness and despair that there is no other alternative. So these radical extremist ideologies build people up because there's nothing else that's building up. I think the more that we can create pathways away from oppression, 
towards hope and towards opportunity, we'll see a better path toward peace in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Luxton. I'd like to put the other side to that, too, because I think that that sense of desperation leads to radicalism, but I think also it is um, introduced because of the desire for power um, and control. And um, that is a whole other side to the, this conversation it is what I, I think the fear in any religion and what do I lose if? Yeah. Um, do I lose my power? Do I lose my thought? What do I lose? And I think while the, the leaders of any religious organization are holding on to that desire for power, um, and really that's combining the political and the religious, but maybe religious power too, then it, it, it's a problem. And I think that causes some of the other challenges. And that in partnership with the desperation is a dangerous combination. All right, thank you very much. Now, Dr. Robeck. Uh, I, I think that uh, fear and ignorance are two of the biggest problems that all of us face uh, with respect to the other, whoever that other is. And I certainly have uh, seen uh, very little of the Middle East. I mean, I have spent time in Israel and I've spent time in Egypt, but I have not spent time in uh, those other countries, although I have many friends in a variety of those countries. Uh, but my sense is that uh, they don't listen very well to each other. And there are vested interests. As, you know, I, I, mean, I have to go back to World War I and to think about what kind of decisions were made in Europe about what Israel's future should look like and where Israel should be housed and who should who should be moved in order to make Israel a state. I'm all for Israel as a state. I'm all for Israeli people. And I'm all for Israel to be able to live in peace with its neighbors. How that uh, comes about, I do not know. But I think Europe uh, and uh, diplomats from Europe and America have both contributed to the problems that we face right now. And uh, I don't see an easy way out of that unless it goes back to the people of the Middle East mm -hmm. and let them resolve it for themselves without all of the political influence that keeps coming in mm -hmm. in a variety of ways. I mean, the mm -hmm. United States has made some, I think, some pretty Thank drastic you. decisions in the last year or two uh, mm -hmm. that I think have impacted the Thank you. possibility for peace in the Middle East at all least right. in the short term. Well, thank you very much. That's all the time we have for today. But thank you for this great discussion. We hope you've enjoyed it. It's one we've had before, and it's likely we're going to have it again. But it is exciting to see what progress is being made and can be made and to think about the future prospects. For now, the Charter of the American Religious Town Hall provides that Roman Catholics, Protestants, Jews, educators, and others may appear on this program and can declare their beliefs without hesitancy. And the rest of the members of the panel will uphold and guarantee that American right to all who will appear, irrespective of race or creed, so that the rest of the world can see that here in America, we believe in civil and religious freedom, not only in theory, but in reality. So now, friends, until next week, at the same time and over this very same channel, the American Religious Town Hall meeting stands adjourned. And may the God of all of us bless all of you.